A missing child. A bomb disguised as a Christmas gift. A civil rights era Klan murderer brought to justice. Join David Ridgen as he and victims' family members track down leads, speak to suspects, and search for answers in the CBC's hit cold case podcast, Someone Knows Something. Subscribe to SKS wherever you get your podcasts. This is a CBC Podcast. Danse Anin, Boujou, hello and welcome. This is Unreserved on CBC Radio 1. I'm Rosanna Deerchild. Flattening the curve, working from home, staying six feet apart. Social distancing is now the new normal. As precautions to stop the spread of COVID-19 increase, so does social isolation, which presents an opportunity to find new ways to stay connected, often with the help of social media. Today on Unreserved, in the time of quarantine, how Indigenous people are creating, finding and sharing community online. Normally at this time, Pahapate Sawi would be preparing for spring ceremonies, a time to thank winter for its gifts and welcome spring growth. But because of the COVID-19 pandemic, Paha has had to make adjustments. Instead of having people in her home and her backyard sweat lodge, she is holding sharing and singing circles online through Zoom, a video conferencing program. Paha joins us to tell us more. Welcome to the show, Paha. Oh, thanks for having me. Well, thanks for being here. So tell me, what are you doing to reach out to the community at this difficult time? Well, to bring people together and still practice social distancing at the same time, we have invited our community to come together uh, once a week. Uh, We're having a sharing circle. We're doing that on uh, an app called Zoom. And we're also bringing people together to learn. We were planning to do this uh, in person to learn some ceremonial songs that we'll be using over the summer. Uh, but we decided to just switch it and do it online through that app, Zoom. Wonderful. Uh, and where did the idea to have online sharing and singing circles come from? Well, I was inspired by witnessing on social media, some of the responses to uh, COVID-19, I saw that there were people that were rushing out and buying up all the toilet paper and all the meat in the grocery store and things like that. And when I, I was surprised when I saw that, but what it said to me was that this is what you do when you're afraid and it's what you do when you're used to competing with other people is you want to get there first and get it all. And then some people turn around and wanted to sell it and make some money off of it. So I thought to myself, well, that's one response to what's happening, but maybe we can have a different response. And I just asked myself, well, my husband and I are, um, we're in that high risk group that everybody is talking about and we need to not have, be around people. Um, And what can we do to support our community from the safety of our own home. And that's when that idea came up. Oh, well, maybe we can do it somehow online. So the past year, we've been having sharing circles with our sun dancers uh, once a month through Zoom because we have dancers from all over the country. And so we started to use this just so people could connect and have a way to talk to each other and see each other. And it worked really well. And so that was almost like we we had a little bit of training mm-hmm. for mm-hmm. now. Yeah. So you held your first um, uh, singing circle on Wednesday. How did it go? Um, well, there were some technical glitches for sure as we tried to figure out how do, how does everybody sing at the same time using mm-hmm. that kind of a t- technology. But uh, eventually we figured it out and... I I said, what do you think? And they said, it was fun. It was good. It's good to connect with each other and those kinds of things. So I think it's going to work. We're going to do it every week. And someday when these, this um, crisis is over and we're gathering together, 
we'll know these songs really well because we will have been learning and practicing them all along. So, Pahal, after you held the circle, technical glitches aside, how did you feel about um, sharing the space and sharing the singing with community? I felt wonderful. So, me too. I've found it difficult. We recently had a funeral just before everybody stopped stopped being around each other. And so we've been going through something here in our our home. And uh, I was looking forward to being able to see my family in that way and coming together, singing together, praying together, and laughing together. I felt so much better at the end of the evening. And I woke up this morning with a different sense of hope and connectedness. Mm. Why do you think it is important to offer this kind of online community to people at this time? I I think that our strength is in coming together. Our strength is in supporting each other. And our our strength is in approaching the crisis from a place that's not sitting in a place of fear. And Mm. I think that when we come together, we can give each other that. And, you know, whenever you share whatever you're going through with someone, it's you reduce it. They carry a little bit of it for you and you carry less. And we need each other. And there's many ways of us to be able to be together and we have to utilize them right now. Yeah. So I had mentioned that normally you'd be holding a ceremony at this time and understand that you've heard from many people that are are asking you to hold private singular ceremony in your home. What are you hearing from people at this time? Well, that's true. So usually what we do is every couple, every second Friday, we have a pipe ceremony and people from the community, our ceremonial family will come and uh, we do that in the winter months. And then soon, um, when it starts to warm up, we go um, to our ceremonial grounds on this property and we have a purification lodge. Mm-hmm. And uh, when I heard that we would not be able to do that, and yet I knew we, this is a time where we really need prayer. Mm-hmm. And, and so I remembered that when we were living in Yellowknife Northwest Territories, that some people from this, our home territory here in Manitoba would call him every once in a while with their troubles and they'd, they ask him to make prayers for them. And he would say, well, we're having a ceremony tomorrow night at six o'clock. Why don't you get some tobacco and just sit quietly and you make prayers at that time. And over here, we'll be making prayers for you as well. Mm-hmm. And, and they would do that. And I could see that was really comforting and it was, a way of being able to participate in ceremony uh, in a, on a spiritual level, even if you weren't there physically. So that was one of my first thoughts is, okay, well, we could still do this. We're, we need to have ceremony. In fact, we're going to have one every Friday now. And we just need to have some trust and some faith that there's something that we need to learn from this experience. And if we're open and that we can we can receive the teaching that's coming to us. Mm-hmm. Are you hearing that people are afraid? Are they feeling anxious out there? Yes, I am hearing that, that people are mm-hmm. afraid. They're afraid for loved ones who have compromised immune systems. They're afraid for our elders, people who are living in close quarters. Uh, sometimes that's in our homes in First Nation communities. That might be in nursing homes, other things like that. That's what they, I've been hearing. And other things. There's so many things to worry about right now. Uh, so whenever we get in, stuck in that place of fear, it's, it's just an awful place to be in. And then it's sometimes hard to see that there's an opportunity for something good. So it's good for us to be able to move out of that and, and go back to what's always helped us to get through difficult times in Indigenous community, and that's our culture, our prayers, our ceremonies, our songs, our practices. Mm. We've been seeing a lot of Indigenous people offering up um, spaces for conversation, beating, even dancing through social media. What do you think that says about us as Indigenous people? Well, I love it. It's wonderful. It's It says that we still are able to practice the teachings of our culture, kindness, generosity, sharing, taking care of each other, uh, and of course, humor. 
That's one mm-hmm. of that. That's we are good at that, and yeah, <laughs> and that's what we need when we're going through something like this. So all those different things, and each of us having gifts and being willing to contribute whatever that gift is. I I'm not surprised. That's what our communities are like. Yeah. How long will you be holding this space for people online? As long as we need it. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much for joining us and sharing that with us. Thank you for having me on the show. Bahapate Sawi is a knowledge keeper and spiritual advisor. She lives in Winnipeg. This is Unreserved on CBC Radio 1, Sirius XM 169, and Native Voice 1. I'm Rosanna Deerchild, talking all about the ways people are building community online. Still ahead, getting together virtually. Zoom is fine and that's great, but you know, you do you really have to show all your workmates your apartment and your possible messy bedroom, you know? <laughs> you know, you can set yourself up in a shared space and, and you can also put on, you know, your best avatar and your hair will be all done and your makeup is all done. <laughs> you, you can, you know, you can be sitting in your underwear, but your avatar <laughs> can be, you know, wearing work clothes. That's in just a few minutes, but first. Author David Robertson had a pretty full calendar this month, including a trip to Germany. But like a lot of us, he's now spending his time at home, juggling work, kids, and writing. And he's finding new ways to connect with his audience. Last week, he read his picture book, When We Were Alone, live on social media. Today, I help my cook them in her flower garden. She always wears colorful clothes. It's like she dresses in rainbows. When she bent down to prune some of the flowers, I couldn't even see her because she blended in with them. She was like a chameleon. Newcomb, why do you wear so many colors, I asked. Newcomb said, well, new system. When I was your age, at home in my community, my friends and I wore many different colors. But at the school I went to far away from home, They gave us different clothes to wear. All the children were dressed the same, and our clothes weren't colorful at all. We all mixed together like storm clouds. Why'd you have to dress like that, I asked. They didn't like that we wore such beautiful colors, Newcomb said. They wanted us to look like everybody else. And this week he read from his middle grade series, The Barren Grounds. David is Swampy Cree and joins us from his home in Winnipeg. Hello, my friend. Hello, Ro. How are you? I'm keeping well. How about you? Oh, we're doing we're doing fine over here. We got a Excellent. house full of five kids and and seven human beings that are, you know, inside. Oh wow, chaos! <laughs> so, what gave you the idea to move your readings onto social media? Well, a couple of things. One of them was, yeah, I mean, I was I did have a bunch of stuff planned uh, that I was going to in the next month and a half uh, that I was really looking forward to. Germany was one in California and Vancouver and all these places. And um, and those obviously got canceled, understandably. And so I, I kind of I missed that interaction. Like I missed I miss going out and meeting people face to face. It's one of the things I really love about being a writer is, um, you know, getting into classrooms, getting into events and doing readings and talks. And um, so I, I missed that. Um, the other thing was, is that like, I have five kids. They're all, they're all out of school now. Last week, most of the kids were out of school. I know that like a lot of kids are, are there at home. You know, they're maybe going a little stir crazy. They're maybe having, they want to, they want stuff to do. They want to be entertained. And honestly, parents at home need that kind of support too, because there's only so much we can do to keep these kids entertained throughout the entire day, every day. And it's going to be a long, long haul. And so um, I saw a lot of other artists you know, going on online and doing these live streams of, you know, readings and um, playing music. And and um, I just thought that it was something that um, felt like it was the right thing to do, you know, um, I, for me. So I could, you know, do the things that I was missing out on doing, but also just for kids and parents to, to do something even just for like 20 minutes out of a day where they can entertain their kids, maybe learn a little something and just have fun watching a book being read. So, um, Mm. yeah, I I found it's been it's been great so far. So it's been uh, on both ends. And how did people respond to your invitation? 
Oh, I th- you know, it's been great. Actually, it's probably better than I thought it would be. Um, there was a lot of, you know, it, uh, like right there live, a lot of people were watching. A lot of people were commenting and asking questions. And from when we were alone, um, live, as soon as I was done, I think there was probably five or 600 uh, views. Um, and then now, um, you know, about five, six days later, I think it's over 6,000 or 6,500. So that sort of interaction, that kind of building of community has been what was really great to see. And then afterwards, because these, these live readings, they instantly are available to replay for anybody. And so I just pin them to my profile. I'm learning all this technological stuff. Mm-hmm. But like you can, and then people can watch them and they can continue the conversation. They can keep, you know, replying and asking questions. They can make comments. They can retweet. And um, yeah, it's been a great way to, I think, just to bring together community where at this time we're living in right now, that's a tough thing to do because we're all at home. We're feeling isolated. We're feeling separate from each other. And this is one way that we can kind of come together and feel like, hey, like we're all in this together. So Mm-hmm. Now, you said earlier that many parents are at home with their kids for a long time, suddenly reading to entertain them and keep them up with schoolwork. Were you thinking about the parents or the kids when you started this? I, you know, as as both uh, a parent and someone who spends a lot of time with kids, just my on, with my own and with other kids, I was thinking about both. You know, I was thinking a lot about parents. I was also thinking about teachers, you know, teachers who are still trying to you know, educate kids who are still trying to go online. And I see teachers posting videos uh, for kids, either like lesson plans or or reading books as well. Um, Parents um, who, you know, for one hour or half hour every day are like, hey, you know, I can put them in front of the screen. I can, you know, have them watch Dave read uh, a book and watch kids crawl over all over him as he's reading. (laughs) And I can, I can, you know, I can just kind of relax for 20, 25 minutes uh, I can watch with my kids. I can have a conversation with them. So, yeah, I was definitely thinking about the whole parenting aspect about this as well, because, you know, I'm a parent, too. And so I know how hard it can be. So, David, what is your uh, your take on on people using social media to to reach out and share in this way during this time? Well, I think you've seen that, you know, social media can be a tool that we can use for good and for bad, you know, so mm. like. Uh, it's kind of like this whole, like, you know, I'm a comic book nerd, so I'll just say, like, it's this whole, like, with great uh, power comes great responsibility. And so how are we going to use this tool um, in a time where we can't connect the way that we usually do? We can't forget that we're still working towards this whole reconciliation thing. And as Indigenous artists, it's a way for us to continue this conversation. And and to me, that conversation really is just like having our voices heard, having our stories told. Uh, being able to interact and speak with uh, Canadians. How are we going to use this tool to connect each other? And I think that social media, and the way that I, I've seen it used across um, the board through this this method, like through um, playing music or, or reading stories, um, has been an incredibly important tool. Certainly. Now, you've done two online readings uh, so far. Are you going to continue doing them? Yeah, so this week, um, every day I'm reading a, a new chapter from my upcoming middle grade book, The Barren Grounds. And so every uh, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, I'm reading chapter one, two, three, four, five. Um, I'm doing it actually in partnership with an amazing middle grade uh, writer in Canada, Susan Nielsen. She's reading from No Fixed Address. And then as the you know weeks wear on, I plan on doing at least a couple of them every week. So um, if people want to tune into my Twitter, um, they can definitely, um, you know, watch it live or watch the replays. I usually pin them to my profile. And I, yeah, I plan on doing a lot more of them because I think it's something um, that I can do, something small that I can do to kind of help out in some small way. Well, thank you so much for your time and for your gift of story, David. Thank you, Rosanna. Thank you for doing what you do. Well, yes, thank you so much. That's David Robertson, an author based in Winnipeg. You can find recordings of his readings on Twitter or links to them on our website at cbc.ca slash unreserved.
This is Unreserved on CBC Radio 1, Sirius XM 169 and Native Voice 1. I'm Rosanna Deerchild. Are you missing being able to talk to your coworkers face to face? Longing for the days when meetings didn't use Zoom, Google Hangouts, or other technology? My next guest is embracing her virtual work meetings. Skawanadi and her team meet in the virtual world Second Life for Work. The Mohawk artist is the co-founder and co-director of Aboriginal Territories in Cyberspace, or Abtech. She's joining us from Montreal to tell us how it works. Hello. Gwei gwei. So describe your virtual Indigenous world. What does it look like? Well, first of all, it's called Abtech Island. Mm-hmm. And uh, when you arrive with your wearing your avatar in Abtech Island, the first thing you see is the celestial tree. Most of the things you'll see on Abtech Island are parts of sets that I made with my wonderful team for machinimas that I've made. And machinimas are movies shot in a virtual environment, like a video game. So you have this beautiful celestial tree, which is from my movie about the creation story, the Haudenosaunee creation story. Um, but surrounding it now are some benches that you can sit on to, so that you can enjoy the tree or chat with your, chat with your fellow avatar. Um, it's in a kind of a plaza, and all around it are different places you can go and look at. There's a museum of the future, I call it. There is the wonderful campfire with the Adirondack chairs around it or the Muskoka chairs around mm-hmm. it. There's also another little corner that has a traditional pre-contact longhouse side by side with a longhouse of the future and a three sisters garden growing out in front. Well, that just sounds lovely. <laughs> And we're going to be posting a few pictures on our website at cbc.ca slash unreserved so people can um, see what it looks like for themselves. So whose idea was it to have uh, a meeting in the comfy chairs around a big fire? Actually, I can't remember exactly which member of our team suggested it. It was my dream come true, though. I, mm. I have been <laughs> I've been hanging out in this virtual world for quite a while, and I've always seen it as a space that could be used as a community space, especially for, you know, our communities who are uh, spread out, like as Indigenous people were spread out across this vast territory known mm-hmm. as North America. I could see this as being a place where we could come together and meet in an embodied way uh, if we couldn't fly somewhere, you know, and talk about our issues or just visit, you know. Awesome. So now that more and more offices are moving to online meetings, what do you think the benefits are of this virtual option that you've created? You know, Zoom is fine and that's great, but you know, you do you really have to show all your workmates your apartment, your possible messy bedroom, you know? (laughs) You know, you can set yourself up in a shared space and, and you can also put on, you know, your best avatar and your hair will be all done and your makeup is all done. <laughs> you, you can, you know, you can be sitting in your underwear, but your avatar <laughs> can be, you know, wearing work clothes. There's an added extra bonus for me, I believe, in why, you know, one of the reasons I like to hang out in a virtual world like this is because there's like a fantasy element. I mean, in this, you know, I've built this world with, again, with the help of my amazing team. I've built this space that's like, it's an indigenous space. You know, where else do you get to hang out around the celestial tree? Yeah. I think it's, so it's, it's just a beautiful for me thing to be able to share with other people, with the people I'm working with. And, you know, we're not, um, we're not a business. So to be in a space that allows us to continue dreaming and imagining is very beneficial. Well, that sounds amazing. I, for one, would make myself 20 pounds lighter and my braids would be perfect every time. Yep, you can do that. Isn't that fun? <laughs> it is. So is this virtual space open to visitors? As a matter of fact, it is. Um, however, you know, you might show up there, Rosanna, and you might, like, not know what, quite what to do since you're a noob. <laughs> <laughs> in our language uh so you might kind of walk around and you might find it you might if you're lucky you know how to walk around but you know you might not quite know how to interact with things or you know and you might feel kind of lonely talk about social isolation if you show up there at 4 p.m and you know no one's even there and that's mm. happened a lot so what we decided to do was to set up activating Aptic island which is the weekly 
time slot that we make sure we're in world. So one, at least one of our team is in world at that time. And they're there to visit with you or to show you around or to tell you, oh, your avatar's hair is actually on backwards. Let me help you, (laughs) you know, Um, and that's turned out to be um, a nice way for people to get into seeing the space. But, uh, you know, I think, again, imagining what the space could be. And, and some nice conversations have happened as well. So I invite you to come on Friday afternoon, 2.30. You know, we have a web page, uh, www.abtec.land. And that um, via that web page, you can uh, figure out how to visit us. Awesome. Well, I will be sure to, um, to get my best avatar outfit on and, and come visit. Hmm. Awesome. <laughs> Thank you so much for your time today. You're very welcome. That's Gawanati, a Mohawk artist and co-founder of Abtech. If you want to find out more about the Second Life world that she's helped create, visit our website, cbc.ca slash unreserved. This is Unreserved on CBC Radio 1, Sirius XM 169, and Native Voice 1. I'm Rosanna Deerchild, talking about all the ways people are finding a sense of community online during this time of isolation. Still ahead. When I first started beading in Toronto, I definitely met other artists who live here and was able to take workshops. And even through Instagram, I have a really large group of artists that every day I log on and I get to see what they're working on and To me, it just, it helps to foster that sense of community that I feel like we all need in this time. Beating may be just the thing to help you while away a few hours. More on that coming up. Good evening, good evening. Welcome to the Social Distance Powwow page. Once again, just some updates here. This weekend, Saturday, March 28th, we're going to be having a one-day social distance powwow. Details will be coming soon. Thank you to each and every one of you joining here. I'm going to be doing shows throughout the week so here we are jennifer and i we're gonna sing the honor song for all the workers and nurses and doctors and paramedics that are out there right now doing this this work for all of us so this song is for you the honor song what I had for sale trying to make some quick cash I have um, tons of these hoops or the loops dangles and anything that's like um, brick stitch dangles is $35 for me anyway come buy my stuff love y'all this is for those of you that can't get out and smudge yourselves please allow the sacred smoke the sage to run away all negative feelings negative energy Hi, my name is Janae Wiley, and I'm going to be dancing for the people who are sick today that are affected by COVID-19, and I hope, hopefully, this dance for the people that are affected by it, and stay safe and stay home. That was a little bit from the Social Distance Powwow Facebook group a page which was created to bring together people who would normally be hitting the powwow trail pretty soon. But earlier this month, North America's largest powwow, the Gathering of Nations in Albuquerque, made the difficult decision to cancel the event. Powwow season is a community staple for First Nation people. It's where different nations meet and also where Indigenous vendors make a large chunk of their annual income. Dan Simons, the founder of Wampum Wear, usually heads out on the road to sell his jewelry and art at powwows. But because events are being cancelled, he decided to launch a digital powwow, which he's calling the Social Distance Powwow. He joins me from Montana. Hello. 
Hello. Recently, the Gathering of Nations canceled their annual general gathering, as I uh, mentioned. As a vendor, powwows are where you sell your jewelry and art. So how did it make you feel to find out the powwow was canceled? So for me personally, I've had a different experiences with this. This has all felt like a dream that hopefully I think I'm waking up from soon because uh, it's kind of amazing that this is all of our reality right now. Um, not just one person is experiencing this. Everyone is around the world, you know, and uh, a lot of vendors, I don't want to just speak for myself. Many vendors rely on POW income for a living, just like myself. Just in the two months of the spring, a lot of vendors lost between 10000 and thirty to forty, fifty thousand dollars $50,000, kind of speaking in general, just like a bracket there that income that we're losing. And, mm-hmm. uh, you know, I was really depressed about this because I try to uh, provide for my family and this has put a damper on me, you know, myself and I know it's hurt a lot of other vendors and there's not really a platform for all of us to sell our wares and not just vendors, but, you know, singers that are affected by this, dancers that are affected by this. There was not really a platform for us to share our voice. So I'm blown away and it's taken off and it's pretty amazing. The support and love, all the support and love outweighs anything that's negative. Absolutely. So for vendors like you, how much can people make on the powwow trail typically? I don't want to speak for myself, but uh, most vendors uh, bracket would be anywhere from twenty five, thirty thousand up to a hundred to one hundred fifty thousand. It just depends on what you're selling. And so, how do people um, participate in the social distancing powwow? So uh, we are on a group page on Facebook right now. Again, this is just a week old, so things are transforming as I'm talking. We, we're trying to focus on live feeds. There's a lot of people that are sending uh, pictures in. You know, we all are kind of used to um, Facebook and getting those likes and comments. But for us in the group, this isn't what it's about. It's not about the likes and comments. It's about people having the platform and all being heard. And uh, one thing I've learned, too, with group pages on Facebook, there's with people trapped in their houses right now, there's a lot of negativity. And this world, there's a lot of negativity. So it's coming out at us. And I know people don't mean to direct it at us. It's just what happens with humans. You know, that's what we are, what we do. A lot of the time we attack ourselves. And this is a time to kind of sit back and reflect on, you know, how did we end up in this space that we're in right now? Mm-hmm. So, Dan, how does the Facebook group work exactly? Okay, so anyone that's on Facebook can uh, join the group. Um, there's about, uh, we're reaching about 70,000 people on there. Right now, uh, this past weekend, we had our first POW online. It was kind of a test. You know, once um, you're on there, I mean, in the, all the, everything's up there on the group. It's been really positive and uh I hope it continues in a positive way. And I'm thankful that I have helped so many people. There's so many people stuck in their homes and this has been an outlet for them to not feel like they're in that space, you know, and to connect with others and all the people that it's brought together has has been kind of magical. I wanted this to have be a platform where we are, you know, this week we're featuring um, storytelling. So there's some people sending in videos just upon their stories, their traditions, you know, from their own tribes. So you had said earlier that um, you've received a lot of love and support, but also criticism. What kinds of um, love and support have you received from community? And how has the turnout been? I'll read you a uh, one that I just sent to my other founders today. Um, this is from a Shinnecock tribal member. I'll leave him one name, but he says, uh, thank you, fam. My mom is able to get that medicine from your page. She's an 84-year-old elder, and she loves what you've created. So getting those messages... Yeah. As, like I said, has definitely outweighed the negative things we've received on this. So is this something that you're planning to continue? This is in its infancy. So uh, this is a platform we want to keep and create. We're kind of still deciding what route to take. Uh, this is definitely, you know, the world right now, we don't know what's going to happen with this virus. This is definitely uh, going to continue as long as this virus continues. And then from there, uh, we're going to just see what happens. You know, I, as uh, one of my elders, uh, I'm from the Pequot tribe in Connecticut myself. So one of my elders, Tall Oak, I just want to give him a shout out. Uh, he always told me, um, we can't plan for tomorrow. You never know what to expect for tomorrow. So I can't plan. You know, I just kind of do what creator guides me to do. So during the pandemic, Indigenous people are gathering um, together and getting creative of how they do it um, over the internet. Is this something that you've been seeing a lot of in the United States? Well, after this platform's launched, I've been seeing people all over the world, a lot of Canadians as well, and the States. Um, So it's been quite the outpour. I mean, just in an hour, we get 100 posts, people wanting to post, you know. Um, if you look online, anything, you'll see a social distance 
powwow is now a movement. Mm -hmm. And I didn't expect this to become a movement. You know, I've had other groups online. This is the first one that went viral. It's just, again, all kind of crazy. Mm. Well, it certainly speaks to a need, right? As Indigenous people, we, we have to gather and be loving with each other. Definitely. Mm. Well, thank you so much for your time today, Dan. Yeah, you're welcome. It was a pleasure to be here, and um, I hope it uh, continues in a positive way. That was the point of all this, just to kind of spread light, love, and positivity with everything that's going on. That was Dan Simons. He launched the Social Distance Powwow, which is a digital powwow for people to share videos of them dancing. And vendors can share videos of the goods they're selling. Honey, this is Tim Fontaine, and I'm the founder and editor in Grand Chief of Walking Eagle News. Walking Eagle News is a satirical website that parodies Indigenous news. Um, I think satire is very important, especially right now, because a big part of satire is humor and laughter. And we could all use more of that in this really crazy and scary time that we're in now. And actually, it's this pandemic and the lockdown that we're all in that inspired me to write one of my latest articles. Uh, I noticed that all of these artists and craftspeople were posting photos of really beautiful beadwork on Instagram, and it made me think, well, what happens when you run out of traditional things to bead? So now I'm going to read that article for you. This is Anishinaabe Woman in Self-Isolation Beads Entire Apartment. An Anishinaabe woman who is in self-isolation because of the global COVID-19 pandemic has beaded her entire apartment. I started beating some moccasins seven days ago and finished those, so I moved on to some medallions, and then I finished all of those, so I started beating my furniture, said Sadie LaRaw from her Regina, Saskatchewan apartment. Next thing, my whole apartment was beaded. Everything from blankets to cutlery and plates, and even the walls and ceiling are now covered in stunning beadwork, photos reveal. LaRaw said she only realized how much beading she had done when she started beading a coat for her cat and ran out of red beads. This is Tim Fontaine, editor and grand chief of the satirical site Walking Eagle News. I've been talking to you while isolated in my living room. Thanks for listening. Thanks, Tim. You're so wise. So wise indeed. This is Unreserved on CBC Radio 1, Sirius XM 169 and Native Voice 1. I'm Rosanna Deerchild. On the show today, we're talking all about how people are finding creative ways to stay connected while keeping their distance. So it's so cool to be able to, like, virtually meet you and bead with you for an hour today. And, like, thank you so much for joining me. I really am uh, glad we get to hang out this way. Yeah, it's fun. That was Amber Sandy beading alongside fellow artist Jamie Gentry in a live beading event on Instagram. Amber launched a series of virtual beating events after the outbreak of COVID-19 began and social distancing was encouraged. She joins me from her home in Toronto. Hi, Amber. Hi. So where did the idea to host a live beating event on Instagram come from? It came from the want to still be around other people and other artists while being stuck at home and doing my part to socially distance and just to create a space for other people to join in and ask questions and provide something for us all to do on evenings while we're sitting at home. Can you describe how the event works? I host the event from my own Instagram and I invite the guest artists to uh, present with me. So it's the two of us both beating on video and the two of us chatting. And other people are welcome to join in on the video to watch us or to listen um, and they can also ask questions by uh, typing, it, typing it out and we can see the questions that people ask. And what kinds of questions are people asking you? People are asking us uh, a variety of questions from what types of materials we use. Uh, some people have been asking about different thread types, what types of thread we like using for different types of beading, all of that stuff. And do you cover how to... Uh how to not get wounded in the fingertips. <laughs> we should cover more of that, but I'm constantly stabbing my own fingertips That's with right. my needles. First aid for the fingertips. <laughs> little tip for you in, in future in future beating exercises. <laughs> yeah. I could use some Instagram beating, I'm going to tell you right now. 
So what has the response been so far? It's been really lovely. Uh, the first one, I definitely, it was unexpected, the amount of people that ended up joining in. Um, I think our first one, we had 120 people come by while it was live. And then we had even more people watch it after it was recorded. So for 24 hours, you can see it on my story after it's recorded. Um, and it was just so nice to have that conversation with some artists that live really far away from me and that I even outside of social distancing don't get to spend a lot of time with. And why are you turning to beating at this time? Do you find it relaxing or calming? I find it relaxing and calming and it's uh, something that I can just focus on and it's a great outlet for sort of the energy that I have um, at this time, but also because it's always been something that's brought community together for me. Uh, when I first started beating in Toronto, I definitely met other artists who live here and was able to take workshops. And even through Instagram, I have a really large group of artists that every day I log on and I get to see what they're working on. And to me, it just it helps to foster that sense of community that I feel like we all need in this time. Mm. In your Instagram post announcing the event, you wrote, let's all try to create virtual spaces to uplift one another and pass the time being socially distant. Why do you think that this is important right now? I think it's important, especially for artists, because a lot of artists don't have, you know, full time jobs where they're getting paid to um, be able to work at home. And I'm fortunate enough to have a job where I get to work at home. So for me, part of it is sharing their art and sharing what they do. So hopefully um, making more people aware of what they have available, but also just bringing each other together and celebrating our work and the amazing things that we do for each other in community, especially during this time. I feel like it's really important to just be there for each other and to take care of each other. We're all dealing with uh, feeling isolated and dealing with different effects on our own mental health that come with being stuck inside. And I think talking with each other and sharing and laughing especially really helps me to feel a lot better about this situation. Mm. You originally launched this as a four-part series. Are you planning to keep it going? I'm going to try to keep it going as long as we're all isolated because it's a great outlet for me and people seem to really enjoy it. So I'm having a lot of fun with it. Oh, I love it. So how can people join in with you to bead? <laughs> so artists can reach out to me if they want to join me on the video feed. Um, and anybody can come and watch the event. They just have to log into Instagram and then click on my Instagram live video while it's happening. And they can come and watch and hang out and ask questions. And what is your Instagram handle? It's at amb, A-M-B, Sandy, S-A-N-D-Y. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you so much for having me. Amber Sandy is an Anishinaabe beater, and she's launched a live broadcasting event on Instagram. She lives in Toronto. Her Instagram handle is at amb, Sandy. That's A-M-B, S-A-N-D-Y. That's it for this week's episode of Unreserved. We'll be back in this radio space next week for more community, culture, and conversation. This episode was produced by Kyle Muzika, Stephanie Cram, Zoe Tennant, and Anna Lazowski. Thank you for listening to Unreserved on CBC Radio 1. Ego saying. For more CBC Podcasts, go to cbc.ca slash podcasts.